فريد I'm not sure why, but I don't hear you. All right, do you hear me? Do you hear me? No? Do you listen to now, me? Yes. Now, yes. Now, yes. Yes, okay. No. Okay. Okay. Great. So, I'm not listening. Okay, у нас какой язык? English or Russian would it? Если честно, даже не знаю. Насколько я понимаю, наверное, все-таки английский, English. потому что могут быть люди, yeah. которые по-русски не понимают. Но начало было 19, да, сейчас уже 19.4 или 19.5. Кавказское время. Можно и так сказать. Но все-таки же организаторы Грузии, у них Association Agreement с Евросоюзом. Они должны быть ближе к Европе более отдаленно от Кавказа, но посмотрим. Мы их никуда не отпустим. Окей. So we will have simultaneous translation English Russia, Russian English. Okay. Hello. Alex. Can you hear me? Can you see yes. Me? Yes. 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 We hear you very well. Benjamin, how are you? I'm sorry for I'm delays. fine. Uh, in the modern world, the technical technicalities mean a lot. Uh, okay. Yes, for sure. Are all uh, we have all the guests with us? Hello. 
Hello. Fine. Hello. How are you? Hello. Good evening. Very good. Hi. Thank you. How are you? Greetings from Istanbul. Hello. Hello. Greetings Hello. from Yerevan. Welcome, welcome all. Thank you very much uh, for your patience. I apologize for some technical uh, problems. And now uh, we, I believe we can start without further delay uh, uh, the, uh, our webinar tonight. Uh, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, it's uh, very, very uh, important and uh, uh, crucial moments and historic moments we are all going through and uh, um, of course uh, we are all uh, watching with a great concern the developments in uh, uh, in Israel and uh, the uh, the brutal attack on uh, on Israel on October 7th uh, um, and I have to underline that uh, we all were preoccupied of course and uh, very very much concerned I must say shocked uh, what we have seen, and uh, we hope uh, uh, very much that uh, the, uh, soon the darkest hours uh, in uh, in Israel will be behind, and uh, and the peace uh, will prevail, and uh, the light will prevail over dark. Uh, of course, our all our minds are preoccupied with. Uh, uh, with uh, the uh, Middle East uh, crisis. Uh, uh, of course, we always uh, look very closely and uh, uh, follow the, uh, the Ukraine's fight against uh, uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine. But uh, uh, one should not forget uh, how important is uh, the, what happened uh, in uh, South Caucasus last month. Uh, and how things are uh, developing. So we decided at the Rondelli Foundation to ask uh, about the implications uh, uh, for the individual countries, for the entire region, uh, uh, the, the distinguished speakers and guests who we have today with us. Uh, I will just name them. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Sine Oscar Sahin. Oscar Sahin, is this correct? Uh, uh, the lead security analyst of uh, Adam's defense research team is the Center for Economics and Foreign Policy Studies from Istanbul. Welcome, uh, dear Sine. Uh, Benjamin Pahosyan, uh, who is the senior fellow on foreign policy at the APRI uh, Armenia and the chairman at the Center of, uh, for Political and Economist, uh, Economic Strategic Studies. Uh, Dr. Farid Shafiev, Chairman at Center of Analysis of International Relations from Baku, Azerbaijan. Um, Kaihan Barzagar, who is the Director of the Center for Middle East Strategic Studies in uh, Tehran. And uh, last but not least, Arkady Dubnov, Political Analyst and Expert on Central Asia uh, from Carnegie Endowment. Uh, for international peace in Moscow, Russia. So um, uh, for the uh, organizational uh, uh, details, I will uh, ask uh, the distinguished uh, guests to speak uh, for five, seven minutes for their uh, introductory remarks. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I will put uh, into the alphabetic order the, uh, the speakers. So we'll start with the uh, Armenian uh, uh, speaker to be followed by the uh, Azeri speaker and uh, to be followed by uh, our Iranian guest um, and uh, the Russian uh, uh, speaker Arkady Dubnov and will be the final uh, word uh, after the, um, uh, uh, our guest from Istanbul. So um, uh, then we will have the round of the second questions. And of course, the, there is a huge interest uh, towards this issue and, and the topic. And uh, I will open the, the floor for the questions. Uh, I have my own questions, a lot of questions to, to each of the participants. But uh, I will uh, let uh, the, uh, the audience to put their questions, please. Uh, here is the sign uh, to raise the hand that you have the question to indicate that you have the question. So uh, without further ado, uh, uh, 
I will give the floor to uh, Benjamin Pogosian, Dr. Benjamin Pogosian from uh, Yerevan. Uh, uh, Benjamin, if you can hear me, uh, please uh, uh, start your uh, share with us your views. Uh, I'm not asking you to, uh, uh, not insisting to give the, the, the picture of the uh, what happened and the latest developments in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, but uh, I hope to hear also from you, it's up to you to evaluate, to reflect on what happened, but I hope to hear also what is going to, to happen next. Uh, uh, there are a lot of talks about peace treaty, about further developments, further uh, maybe tensions, maybe uh, 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 possible not highest level contacts. So please, please, Benjamin, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, then we will follow as I announced. Uh, thank you, Alex, <laughs> and thanks for Rondeli Foundation for organizing this very timely webinar. And of course, thanks for invitation. I believe that after September 2023 events in Nagorno-Karabakh, I'm not going to go into the details. I believe everybody knew what happened. On September 19, Azerbaijan launched its military offensive, which Azerbaijan called anti-terrorist operation. Then uh, we witnessed almost entire Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh left the region. Uh, up to 102,000 people now are in Armenia. And I guess according to various estimates, maybe maximum 100 people, Armenian people were left in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, so in general, there are two perceptions what may happen after this. So perception number one, according to this view, the Nagorno-Karabakh or the existence of Nagorno-Karabakh was the primary obstacle on Armenia-Azerbaijan peace treaty. So after the de facto destruction of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, most probably it will facilitate the signature of peace agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, very soon, if not by the end of 2023, maybe early 2024, then this itself will open the way for Armenia-Turkey normalization. We heard many times from Turkish authorities, including President Erdogan, that after Armenia-Azerbaijan peace treaty is signed, Turkey is ready for full normalization. Then, again, the narrative tells that this also will bring the significant decrease of Russian presence in South Caucasus, because first, Without Armenians, most probably Russian peacekeepers cannot stay in Nagorno-Karabakh. And I'm not speaking about after November 2025, because initially their mandate expired, will expire on November 2025. But now there are discussions that even Russian peacekeepers may leave earlier, because if there are no Armenians, then what Russian peacekeepers are doing? Then if we have an Armenia-Azerbaijan peace and then Armenia-Turkey normalization, probably Armenia will uh, feel itself less dependent on Russia, will be no fear or less fear from future Azerbaijan or Turkish attacks. Then Armenia may continue its diversification of its foreign policy, pulling more and more away from Russia, coming closer to the West. And this may end by the withdrawal of Armenia from collective security treaty organization, from Eurasian Economic Union. And even discussions are made that at the end of the day, maybe even Russian military base uh, will be removed from Armenia and also uh, Russian border troops will be removed from Armenia. So according to narrative number one, somewhere within one or two years, we will have more or less stabilized South Caucasus, at least Armenia, Azerbaijan, Turkey. Uh, we will have less Russia and we will have more West, more the European Union, more United States, mostly through so the uh, presence or increased influence and presence in Armenia. But also given that despite all this uh, development between Georgia and the West, Still, Georgia is a U.S. strategic partner, and no one canceled major association agreement between Georgia and the European Union, nor the strategic partnership charter between Georgia and the United States. Uh, so this is scenario number one, but also there is scenario number two. According to this scenario, Nagorno-Karabakh was one of the uh, like contention issues between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but not only one. We have also the issue of border delimitation and demarcation, Armenia believes that up to 200 square kilometers of Armenian territory already under Azerbaijani control, Azerbaijan denies. Azerbaijan speaks about enclaves. Just very recently, also President Aliyev, I believe, made the statement that eight 
on what the beliefs are, are still on, on the Armenian control, and Armenia should give it back. Then we have the issue of these routes or corridors or whatever you may call, which should connect uh, Azerbaijan with Azerbaijan and Turkey via Armenian uh, Armenian province unique. Then we have also this concept of Western Azerbaijan, which is being cultivated in Azerbaijan recently. And according to this uh, concept, like if not the entire majority of current Armenian territory where historically Azerbaijani lands, and according to this concept, Azerbaijani should uh, settle in Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan are speaking about hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijanis. So all this means that most probably, even if currently there is an Nagorno Karabakh public, because the president signed the decree to dissolve the republic by the end of 2023, and there are no Armenians in Nagorno Karabakh, but still, Armenia Azerbaijan peace is not viable. And at least it's uh, naive to hope that the peace agreement will be signed within three, four, six months. Then that there also will be no normalization between Armenia and Turkey, plus Russia are not going to move out from Nagorno Karabakh. We are hearing statements from Russia that still Russian peacekeepers are needed there for whatever reasons. And also Russia is clearly sending signals that uh, we are not going to leave South Caucasus. And my understanding is that Azerbaijan also is not keen to put much pressure on Russia or to deteriorate Russia-Azerbaijan relations. We have also Turkey, which is balancing between Russia and the West. And simultaneously, we see this uh, more influence or renewed influence on this platform of free plus free. The idea is that, okay, uh, the problems of the South Caucasus should be solved within South Caucasus, Turkey, Russia, Iran, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia. We knew that so initially Georgia declined this idea. And in December 2021, the first meeting on deputy foreign minister level in Moscow took place without Georgia's participation. But still, we see more and more emphasis by Turkey, Iran, Russia, and even by Azerbaijan, that maybe this three plus three is the best way uh, to move forward. So according to this uh, second narrative, uh, situation will be tense. And most probably instead of uh, decreased Russian influence and more West in the South Caucasus, we will see some joint efforts between Russia, Turkey, and probably Iran to manage their rivalries and somehow to create new status quo in South Caucasus probably trying to replicate what they did in Syria, starting from 2016, 2017. I mean, uh, Astana uh, Personally, I'm not too much optimist. I don't believe that very soon the peace agreement can be signed, and I don't believe that very soon Russia will leave South Caucasus, the West will come, and South Caucasus very soon will be transformed into some sort of very close partner of the West and the European Union. My understanding is that our region is much closer to the Middle East. And I believe that uh, more or less here, we will see competition and also management of relation between Russia, Turkey, and Iran. So I'm not sure that Armenia-Azerbaijan peace treaty is coming. Also, it's difficult to say we'll have another war between Azerbaijan and Armenia or no. Will Azerbaijan try to use force, either to receive routes, through unique, the so-called Zangezor corridor, or to force Armenia to Except these uh, hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijanis who allegedly are ready to come uh, to Armenia. It's difficult to say, but one thing for me is clear that first, I don't believe that we are very close to the peak. Second, I don't believe that we will see South Caucasus under like European US uh, control or the European or US zone of influence. My understanding is that we will still see the rivalry, both rivalry and also attempts to manage. South Caucasus is mostly between Russia, Turkey, and Iran, and more or less this uh, semi and stable situation will continue as far as there is a no final understanding what the global or at least European security architecture will be. Because I believe we all agree that uh, the war in Ukraine will end only when there will be some new understanding between great powers about the emerging new European security architecture. What will be this security architecture? Nobody knows. I believe that this fluid situation in South Caucasus will remain in place as far as there is no greater understanding about global European security architecture. And then maybe also South Caucasus will find a way in this emerging new order. Thank you. And I'm ready for a few days session. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Thank you. Uh... I definitely, certainly support the first uh, more optimistic scenario uh, to be developed. And uh, uh, today we have heard that uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan 
uh, will not take part in the uh, the heads of states uh, council meeting in in Bishkek of the CIS and uh, the Commonwealth of the Independent States. So uh, you uh, mentioned about the association agreement of Georgia. I remember, I recall uh, the times when uh, Armenians were ahead of Georgia in negotiations with European Union on uh, association agreement. You were almost done uh, with the agreements. Uh, so should we expect, uh, uh, are these all these uh, signs um, and joint drills with American military, uh, uh, possibility of uh, signing the agreement on military cooperation with France, um, uh, withdrawal or not participating in the CSTO uh, meetings as well as the, some other events, as well as now in the CIS meetings. Uh, should we expect that uh, this is these are the first signs of uh, uh, U-turn in the uh, Armenian foreign policy priorities, and should we expect uh, uh, the EU uh, association agreement to be signed or to be revitalized in the nearest future? Okay, I'm sorry, this is the last part of your question. To revitalize or resign the association agreement with the CFPA, even compared to the area, Armenia should leave the region accordingly. This is now the wrong side between our media thinking towards the official procedure. And I'm not sure about the procedure itself, but definitely, even if our media decides to leave the original economic union, this can be done. This cannot be done within several months. Which means that even if the process starts, it will take time, maybe years, and only after that, our media will sign the association agreement. Because the agreement with our media signed with the European Union in November 2017 set up a comprehensive and advanced partnership agreement. This was almost the same association agreement minus ECFP. The political part was 95% the same text. Again, to sign a deal for free comprehensive trade area with the European Union, Armenia should leave the original economic union. And this is not going to happen in a fairly near future. Regarding Armenian foreign policy, definitely, we need to see actions to the diversity of Armenian foreign policy, lots of different policy. Starting from 2022, the main target was India. Um, Benjamin, um, I apologize for jumping in, but uh, something is wrong. Uh, I see here the concerns regarding the voice. Uh, it's the very strong noise uh, interfering. It's maybe about okay, the... Is, let me actually my uh, earphone will come back. Okay, okay. Okay. Not now. Is it okay. Now I hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so I will uh, repeat very briefly. I was telling that to be able to sign association agreement with European Union, Armenia first need to leave Eurasian Economic Union because association agreement means also DCFTA, deep and comprehensive free trade area. Yes. And just to remind that in November 2017, when Armenia signed its agreement with the EU, SEPA, Comprehensive Enhanced Partnership Agreement, this was almost the same association agreement text minus DCFTA, because the political part was 95% or more than 95% the same text. So regarding the possibility to sign association agreement in the near future, this is impossible because for that, Armenia should leave the Eurasian Economic Union. Currently, no one in Armenia officially speaks about that, and even if decision will be made, it will take time. It's impossible to say that, okay, tomorrow Armenia decides to leave the Eurasian Economic Union. In December 31, Armenia left the Eurasian Economic Union. And in January 2024, Armenia is signing association agreement. I don't believe in uh, such very quick uh, uh, developments. 
Regarding Armenian foreign and defense policy, yes, uh, Armenia is in the process of the diversif diversification. It started mm -hmm. in 2022 from India. We all know that Armenia signs several arms supplies deals with India and some supplies has already started. Now we see the defense cooperation or at least talks about potential defense cooperation with France. The key issue is here, does diversification means also a alienation of Russia because you can diversify your foreign defense and security policy, but it does not automatically mean you should become an enemy of Russia or you should take hostile actions against Russia. Until very recently, Armenian government was very cautious both to diversify and also not to an an antagonize Russia. Yes, in September 2023, some steps were taken, uh, which probably irritated Russia. I mean, the first lady visit to Kiev, uh, the ratification of Rome's statehood in early October 2023. Of course, uh, I cannot speak on behalf of Armenian government if decision was made not only to diversify, but also to antagonize Russia. But my understanding tells me that in South Caucasus, Russia is and will be one of the strong players. And I, and I don't believe that uh, such a compact country as Armenia is, with less than 3 million population, currently it will be a wise thing to antagonize Russia. And let's not forget that if you are antagonize, antagonizing Russia and telling your desire coming closer to the EU and the United States, you also will have problems with Iran, because Iran definitely will not be happy to see some pro American uh, country close to its border. Iran already is unhappy to see Israel Azerbaijan strategic defense partnership. Definitely will be more unhappy to see also Armenia becoming some kind of very close friend to the United States. So, uh, my uh, understanding is that from Armenian uh, perspective or from vital interest of Armenia, diversification is needed. But diversification does not automatically mean uh, antagonizing Russia. And I hope that Armenia will not transform itself into a the Georgia of 2004, 2005, 2006. I mean, the first three, four years uh, mm -hmm. term of uh, former president Mikhail Saakashvili, or Armenia is not going to transform itself into the Ukraine of 2020, 2021, because we all see imp implications of such um, developments. And Armenia is too compact uh, to be able to jump into this uh, area and i don't believe that Armen it is of armenia's interest to become another battlefield between russia and the united states so my understanding is that yes diversification is needed like it's objectively is needed because russia is now almost fully focused on ukraine and its war against the collective west but i don't believe that antagonizing russia is a wise or right move on armenian side okay uh okay thank you thank you benjamin uh now we will switch to uh, uh, Dr. Shafir. Uh, uh, Farid, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Alex. And it's always a pleasure to, to be part of discussion of Randel Foundation. I'll just go directly to uh, talking points um, to our discussion. Um, I'm, I welcome that we are not much discussing what happened in the past because First of all, because of the time constraint, and second, I don't think now, anyway, it's it's uh, fruitful to discuss uh, past, though um, the past is still haunting us. So um, about peace and the future of the region, indeed, and I agree that uh, the Karabakh issue and uh, all this territorial issue, which Azerbaijan considers as the territorial claims uh, towards Azerbaijan because let's not forget the whole uh, issue around Karabakh began uh, with the issue of unification Niatsum. so it was a territorial claim but now it's ended and we believe in Azerbaijan that there is the indeed big potential for peace the meeting between um, leaders of Azerbaijan and Armenia scheduled in Brussels in the end of the month the Brussels platform uh, manifested its, um, how to say, more product productivity. So uh, exactly on, on that platform, we uh, had at least the contours of the future peace, peace treaty. Peace treaty probably uh, will have uh, some fra framework content, not the details. So, and it, it won't be the long uh, text. However, it will be signed in the near future or not, it's hard to say. I think Azerbaijan indicated that it's uh, 
uh, its desire to finish it uh, and by the end of the year but again different times we had different hopes so it's much more complex situation in some in armenia also azerbaijan uh, suggested now to have direct talks between armenia and azerbaijan why because indeed the, though the brussels platform was quite productive but still we we have uh, rivalries regional rivalries geopolitical rivalries between Russian platform, Brussels, Washington. Uh, so um, probably direct talks can remove this kind of uh, concerns from, from geopolitical actors. Um, the physically, uh, the president of Azerbaijan recently was in, in Tbilisi in, on Sunday. He said that uh, uh, the Georgia can be the place for the meetings or can be some other places. Physically, we can meet anywhere. But important to have direct conversation between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, also, President now the second time uh, uh, said about the regional platform. But before coming to three plus three, um, President of Azerbaijan uh, made proposal about three countries platform of three: Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia. That idea was um, voiced last year in December and supported by the Georgian Prime Minister Garibashvili. So there is no feedback yet from Armenia about this. Because this is, I think, also important in a way that to avoid, though we cannot avoid definitely uh, countries around us with their regional, different regional interests, uh, Russia, Turkey, Iran, but plus EU, United States, and now we have also India uh, approaching Armenia, etc. Et Ch China has their own, but at least we're speaking about sort of regional uh, ownership, regional platform of three countries. So that's another important platform, the, the second uh, avenue uh, to promote peace in the region. And definitely in parallel with the Ar Armenian Azerbaijani peace process, uh, uh, Armenian Turkish normalization process is also important. And I think if we will have progress between Armenian and Azerbaijan peace treaty, then uh, the issue of Armenian Turkish normalization will also move slowly, uh, uh, smoothly, sorry. sorry. Um, but there is some problems um, here uh, for, Current discussion, which we have in the, especially in the Western media and expert community, there is the focus on Armenian refugees, on uh, situation around uh, Karabakh. Uh, again, I don't want to speak much about the reintegration proposal, which is voiced by the uh, Azerbaijan leadership. And now there are some contours of this reintegration. But for Azerbaijan, what Armenia considers, and from what uh, my colleague said, Benjamin Pagasian, about uh, sort of territorial claims uh, when we're speaking about Western Azerbaijani community or whatever. For Azerbaijan, discussion about post-conflict development and future peace is not inclusive. Why are we speaking about only about Armenian refugees? Where is Azerbaijan refugees from both from uh, Armenia? and also from Karabakh. And let's not forget that uh, 40, between 40 to 50,000 Azerbaijanis lived inside former Nagorno-Karabakh autonomy. So even in, in the Hankandi city, where it was, uh, where were Azerbaijan. So discussion about the displaced people should be inclusive. So if Armenians would like to live, or we, we have to think about Armenians living in Azerbaijan, why we are not thinking about Azerbaijan's living in Armenia. So Armenian side uh, quickly, you know, throwing the accusation of the territorial claims, but it is more about mosaic, inter-ethnic mosaic, which we had in the South Caucasus before the conflict, before 1980s. The second problem is indeed uh, past strategies and humiliations. Uh, so it's still haunt uh, people. Uh, I understand that in Armenia now they feel they themselves humiliated, but not forget that Azerbaijan 30 years lived in such uh, conditions of humiliation and still people are 
uh, you know, it won't be easy to overcome those uh, humiliation and tragedies overnight. So it's the long process of reconciliation. And we have practical problems, two practical problems. It's the landmines. People cannot return and, and or process of, uh, of the return is very slow because of the landmine contamination and destruction. So Azerbaijan needs billions and billions of dollars investing. So, um, and within this process of peace, uh, already also my colleague Benjamin Pagasian mentioned delimitation and uh, transport corridor are here also to make some clarifications. Um, yes, Armenia claims that the Azerbaijan controlled part of its territory, but uh, Azerbaijan uh, has uh, rightful concern about the enclaves. So it, there are enclaves and they are under Armenian control. There are eight uh, Azerbaijani enclaves still under Armenian controls and one enclave Armenian control under, uh, uh, un, un, and one Armenian enclave under Azerbaijan control. So I think that is up to the delimitation. So where borders crossing, uh, the, the maps should be uh, agreed upon, but that's the second step after uh, peace treaty. In our it's the issue is the transportation corridor, also peace treaty, um, at least the envisages opening of transportation links. Here again, the conversation about Zangezur corridor uh, brings the issue of uh, whether Azerbaijan would like to it, uh, have some extra territorial control. Uh, I think we should be clear, the president of Azerbaijan said that he has, uh, I mean, the whole process should go through diplomatic channels. There is no more war should be, uh, and Azerbaijan is ready to have this chapter turned, wars and uh, the clashes. Azerbaijan investing billions of dollars into liberated territories is not interested to have uh, clashes uh, and you know new destructions. Uh, so let's uh, remember that Armenian territory per se, except the events in September 2022, but Armenian territory has not suffered from all this 30 years conflict. It mostly remained untouched. Uh, so it's the most destructions happen on Azerbaijan territory. So it's Azerbaijan interested in a, a new development. As far as the transportation links, now, again, I would like to reconfirm that Azerbaijan has no intention to do anything by force, only through diplomatic channels. My understanding that for Armenia, anything about the transportation links uh, through Zangezur or they call it Megri, um, it's kind of um, psychologically difficult question to accept. So Azerbaijan uh, began working with Iran and uh, to create the alternative route to, to Nakhchivan. So um, again, uh, it's up to Armenia to decide, Armenian people decide whether they would like to be part of the regional railway network. I think example of Azerbaijan and Georgia creating pipeline network, energy network and railway network is good example that yeah, there is no kind of issues with between two countries. I mean, there might be some problems uh, between two countries, some minor problems which can be fixed, uh, but uh, strategically, this is example how the two countries benefiting from all this. If Armenia is not going to have links, the transportation links, again, we cannot force them. But I think Armenians uh, already in the 90s uh, rejected pipelines through its territory. If now it's rejecting railways connections, again, it's up, up to them uh, to decide. So, but anyway, Azerbaijan, as I said, again, would like to have uh, some peace platform in the region. So basically that's my um, uh, remarks. Um, uh, there was some questions about the geopolitical actors. Uh, again, uh, we should be realistic. Three countries around us, they have their own interests. Somehow we cannot exclude neither countries, Russia, Iran, Turkey. I mean, I mean Turkey already in the region with a lot of projects. Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkey with energy and mm, railway projects. Russia also, I mean, with Armenia still there in the economic union and is still in the military union. But that, that's the reality of our geography. So, and we have to take into that account. That doesn't mean that we should not uh, work with the United States or European Union, but 
we should also think that their approach to the region should be based on, on, on reality of ge geography. That's it. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Farid. Uh, I just, uh, I, I was really very happy to hear that, uh, uh, to hear that uh, um, uh, Azerbaijan side is also ready to, to sign uh, the peace treaty, um, the outlines or the framework we can call it, and uh, if it happens uh, either in Brussels or here in Georgia, in Tbilisi, we will be uh, more than happy. Then, uh, of course, it is about the delimitation. But uh, let me ask you uh, two questions. Uh, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, if there is no agreement uh, on Zangezur uh, corridors, Zangezur Megri corridors, uh, uh, exp uh, exploitation. So uh, peace treaty anyway will be signed. And the second question is, uh, what's going to happen to the uh, uh, Russian troops which are on your soil? Uh, there is an agreement until 2025, but uh, uh, there is no more need for this uh, for these troops. And uh, I saw today uh, Sergei Lavrov's letter that. Uh, uh, there is no need for the involvement of uh, Brussels or Washington, EU or the United States and Russian peacekeepers could provide uh, the, uh, uh, the necessary uh, uh, conditions for uh, developing the uh, good neighborly relationship between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia. Are, are they going to stay until the end of the agreement or uh, uh, today's uh, Patrushev also is in town in the uh, company of two uh, military vessels for the friendly courtesy visit in Baku? Yes, uh, with regard to the um, transport links, uh, Zangez or Mingri, uh, I think Peace Treaty is, is the first important step. Uh, the other uh, ramifications, the limitation that's in our process, which will come out of the peace treaty, and transportation links. Again, they are not uh, kind of related to each other in a way that it's not one excluded other. So, but I think and I believe the peace treaty is must. And after that, you can speak about delimitation and you can speak about uh, opening of transportation links. If again, Armenians is okay. not opening transportation links, Zangezur, uh, I think again, that will be the, the closed matter. Uh, who will lose, who will uh, win? Again, the history will show, but all, as I already said, that the Azerbaijan Georgia example is, is a good example of win win situation. Um, the uh, situation has changed. I mean, where was the idea before, like two years ago in 21, uh, President Alif said that let's not have checkpoints on Lachin and uh, on Zangizur, but was, that was rejected. So I think that that's not relevant anymore. As far as the Russian troops, uh, it's the goal of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is non allied country and is our goal not to have any foreign troops on our territory. So we have uh, this uh, statement uh, dated 2020, and I should tell you, uh, the biggest advocate of Russian presence in the South Caucasus was always Armenia. I mean, now we have different situation, but for 30 years, we were very happy with the Russian presence on their soil. And uh, when happens the 2020 war was also uh, uh, the Armenian leadership was insisting that uh, Russia is the guarantor. So uh, Azerbaijan approaching to this issue that it should be also resolved through the diplomatic channels with Russia now because there's no need for, for the third party. Uh, and this is the, uh, how the discussion now going on between uh, Azerbaijan and Russia. Whether they will leave earlier than 2025, I don't know. Um, Russia always trying to find some reason that for to staying here. And also Russia, uh, Azerbaijan understand that uh, this is the issue which is indeed should be uh, amicably resolved between Azerbaijan and Russia. Okay, thank you very much for it. Now, as far as I know, uh... We have our Iranian colleague uh, uh, with us. Yes. 
Good evening, uh, good evening, and uh, uh, welcome. Uh, uh, you you catch up what uh, our colleagues uh, from Armenia and Azerbaijan have said. Uh, uh, we are very much interested in uh, how is all these processes viewed from Tehran. Uh, what are the implications? What are the perspectives? How do you look? at the, uh, the economic perspectives and does uh, Iran see itself just uh, the, our Azerbaijani colleague, uh, Dr. Shafiev has mentioned that uh, there could be the, uh, the route uh, connecting uh, Azerbaijan with Turkey through uh, Iran. So it's very much interesting to hear from you how you view all these developments in South Caucasus. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, I appreciate inviting me. Uh, uh, I'm happy that the situation, although it has been very fast based on the uh, geopolitical uh, you know, adjustment and environment, but uh, I think that we have finished the uh, military phase and now we are, we are in a kind of uh, political situation and we should see how the situation with would go ahead. As far as Iran's stance, I think Iran has made it clear that uh, the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, Republic of Azerbaijan is important and Iran has always thought that, you know, its territory returned to the country and now uh, when it is finished, then, then uh, Iran's uh, position uh, goes to the second aspects of Iran's foreign policy and that is that Iran has always insisted that it will not accept any change of geopolitics or change of borders, uh, which is a traditional style of Iran's foreign policy. Iran has always uh, been in favor of not changing any uh, borders in the region, for instance, in Syria, in other places. Uh, that's why it's uh, worried that uh, this uh, kind of change uh, might bring, uh, uh, you know, the conflict and war, a new war in the region that could be uh, somehow influenced by foreign actors, which is exactly the point of Iran that could bring this, this could bring a kind of unpredictable situation. From the Iranian stance, this unpredictable situation uh, could be translated to the presence of uh, the NATO as it goes to the Zangzur corridor, or the presence of, uh, you know, the Israeli uh, behind the scene influence in Iranian border. That's why Iran is sensitive about that. Uh, therefore, I think, uh, but a new development is, uh, is, is fine for Iran. And because we see Azerbaijan more relaxed nowadays and it's, uh, it's talking of the peace treaty, but that at the same time, I believe that the, uh, the political security system of South Caucasus is extremely, you know, uh, complicated. Any foreign involvement could somehow bring more complication for the uh, regional politics and a new front for Iran's, uh, you know, uh, uh, national security. Uh, the, the Iranian government right now is following and extremely is in favor of neighborhood, uh, you know, increased relations and would like to have good relations with Azerbaijan and Armenia at the same time. Uh, and therefore, it, it is in favor of, you know, stability to be established in the region. And I think this has been stressed by Iranian high official, like the head of the Iranian uh, army and at the same time, Iranian National Security Council that uh, so far it's fine because the uh, Azerbaijan has reached its aim that is to restore its tr traditional in uh, territorial integrity. But even if it goes further, then the situation would be different. I think this is exactly the sensitive point. And I, I believe that Azerbaijan uh, understand uh, Iranian concerns when it goes to the regional development. Uh, again, traditionally, uh, you know, Iran's foreign policy has been oriented towards the West, South and East. Uh, those places that we had a lot of, you know, uh, national security concerns that relates to America and, and Israel and asymmetric concerns like anti 
terrorist uh, efforts by suppressing, you know, Al Qaeda or Daesh or other anti-Iranian forces. Uh, therefore, Iran uh, uh, has never, uh, uh, to much extent, uh, oriented to the to the north and has always tried to balance the situation, geostrategic situation, by Russia. Russia's position is different now, as I said uh, in my uh, the beginning of my talk. The geopolitical environment has changed, has been very fast. Therefore, we need to adjust ourselves with the, with the situation. At the same time, we need to understand that, you know, uh, any change of border could be somehow, uh, you know, concerns Iran right now. The, the domestic politics of Iran, public opinion, are are forcing the Iranian government to take action if there is something new going on beyond the, uh, the, the current situation, that is the change of border. That's why I believe that this corridor of Zangzur, because Armenia is a weaker position and Turkey, Azerbaijan and other are in a, in a more forceful position, that would not benefit the situation right now. I think the plan B of cooperating with Iran and involving Iran in the entire regional politics is very cooperative and very helpful. And I'm glad that the situation is going to that, uh, to that way and peace treaty, because it is something that is needed for, for all parties in, in the region. And my last point is about, because people are talking always about uh, the possible Iran-Turkey clash on this, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say that Iran and Turkey understand that the language of their power very well. And uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan should never uh, count of Turkey or Israel that would help, you know, Azerbaijan to change the uh, regional geopolitics because they would not to somehow extend, uh, you know, tensions and their relations with Iran. Uh, therefore, I think uh, the situation, I'm, I'm very hopeful that the situation would go towards a diplomatic solution, which is going, by the way. And uh, uh, my last point is that Iran has always seen the uh, South Caucasus, uh, you know, uh, region as a developmental region, a way to reach to Europe, a way to somehow integrate its economy, a way to somehow export its energy. Therefore, uh, if uh, any try try to somehow constrain Iran's attempt to this connectivity to Europe or other places, Russia, uh, elsewhere, I think that this might bring a lot of security concerns, not only for the Iranian government, but also for the Iranian public. As I mentioned, the Iranian public uh, could pressure the government to, uh, to get involved in an unwanted situation. Which is, uh, which is unpredictable. Right now, uh, the best policy is to uh, resort to diplomatic approach because uh, any conflict, any war, as the example of the regional conflict uh, show us, could uh, bring unpredictable situation. We should not forget about proxy wars. Uh, we should not forget about, you know, foreign involvement that could uh, use, uh, you know, the regional politics as a geostrategic instruments to follow their own interests. A lot of, you know, uncertainties could, could follow. Therefore, the best is uh, the diplomatic approach, and Iran is right now trying to go in that direction. I stop here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will certainly come back to you, uh, Mr. Barzagar. Uh, with, uh, with uh, another round of questions now, let me go directly to Mr. Dubno. Uh, as far as I know, he is with us uh, already. And uh, 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 Mr. Dubno, can you hear me? Okay, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Dubno. So, uh, uh, the Russia's uh, Russia's position, Russia's view from Moscow. Uh, um, I have heard uh, several times from the uh, uh, Armenians at the, at the protests at the Central Square in uh, in Yerevan after the developments about the uh, betrayal from uh, from Russia of its uh, strategic uh, partner in the South Caucasus. Uh, uh, also the uh, the troops are still there, uh, the Russian troops uh, 
in, in Armenia and in Gyumri and the Russian border guards are uh, um, uh, still uh, controlling the Armenian border, participating in the control of the Armenian border. So, um, uh, what is the uh, what is this um, all the, the the result in the, in Nagorno Karabakh? Is uh, is there is any uh, uh, are there any signs of deal between uh, uh, Russian Federation and uh, Azerbaijan, or uh, Russia's hands are busy uh, with the uh, war in Ukraine, or uh, is this the uh, uh, weakening position of Russia in South Caucasus. Please, Mr. Dubnov, the floor is yours. Да, спасибо за возможность участвовать в конференции. Она оказалась чрезвычайно, чрезвычайно, так сказать, вовремя uh, созванной, uh, хотя никто не предполагал, что так кардинально изменится мировая ситуация. Значит, прежде чем ответить на конкретно ваш вопрос, хотел бы отметить, я независимый политолог российский, и сказанное мной ни в коей мере не отражает позицию официальной России. Она отражает мою личную точку зрения, аналитика, которая занимается проблемами после вот уже 30 лет. Первое. Второе. Сегодня, после того, что началась война на Ближнем Востоке, в результате нападения Хамас на Израиль, в результате, так сказать, активного привлечения к зоне боевых действий американской авианосной группы, Внимание к региону Ближнего Востока превалирует гораздо больше, чем то внимание, которое было до сих пор к району Южного Кавказа. Проблема Южного Кавказа отступает на задний план, во всяком случае, восприятие мировых держав, в том числе и России. С этой точки зрения я полагаю что есть сейчас хорошее окно возможностей для решения проблемы Южного Кавказа, армяно-азербайджанского конфликта силами самого региона Южного Кавказа. И, и здесь есть два, есть развилка между двумя трендами, как может развиваться, как можно быть использовано это окно возможностей, когда мир ослабил внимание Южному Кавказу. Да? Первое окно возможностей связано с ну, предложениями встретиться, предложениями господина Алиева встретиться в Грузии. Да, пока оно, я не знаю сигналов из Армении относительно согласия на эту встречу. Но это интересный поворот, и он возник внезапно. Еще перед, он упреждает встречи, которая намечается в конце октября в, в Европе. Да? Поэтому это такой, я бы сказал, форс-мажорный ход Азербайджана, и он, мне кажется, интересен. Второй ход опять связан с Азербайджаном, поскольку, если обратить внимание на заявление, сделанное главой Совета Безопасности Азербайджана генералом Усуговым, что у Азербайджана, что у Армении остается очень мало времени, чтобы решить проблему соглашения с Азербайджаном. Явно этим заявлением Баку дает понять, что, что Азербайджан подталкивает, спешит и дает понять, что если Армения будет опять как бы тормозить выполнение условий, которые предлагает Азербайджан в качестве, так сказать, победителя, в качестве страны, которая имеет возможность навязывать свои условия, то Азербайджану придется решать проблему опять какими-то другими способами. Какие другие способы обычно применяет Азербайджан, как бы известно. Да? И поэтому у меня ощущение, что 
если не будет действительно какого-то реального мирного дипломатического продвижения, то, э, несмотря на госп... заявление господина Алиева, которое здесь цитировалось, что арми... Азербайджан больше не будет вести военных действий, э, я думаю, что э, исключать такого развития нельзя. Э, учитывая опыт предыдущих, так сказать, э, э, обострений. Э, второе. Россия, чего хочет Россия? Знаете, если исходить из заявления МИД России от 25 сентября, то там все сказано, что соглашение ноября 2020 года по окончанию 44-дневной войны означали некоторое джентльменское соглашение между всеми сторонами относительно того, что решать конфликт нужно будущим поколениям, отложить решение конфликта будущим поколениям. Что это означает? Не только на мой взгляд, но и на взгляд, естественно, трезвых наблюдателей. Что Россия вообще не заинтересована была в решении этого конфликта в протяжении, на данный момент времени и надолго вперед. Другими говорями, Россия была заинтересована в заморозке этого конфликта на долгое время, что давало возможность сохранить свое военное присутствие на Южном Кавказе. После войны, после, но это входило в противоречие с позицией Азербайджана, который продемонстрировал, что замораживать конфликт он не намерен. Война это показала, и последствия последних конфликтов показали, что Азербайджан будет решать проблему силовым способом и не оставляет шансов на заморозку конфликта. Что остается делать в этой, России, в этой ситуации России? Она главным трендом политики России сегодня, на мой взгляд, является попытка сохранить хоть каким-то образом свое военное присутствие в регионе. С этой точки зрения я бы предположил, что сегодняшний визит господина Патрушева в Баку может свидетельствовать о том, что идут Россия пытается оговорить с Азербайджаном условия пребывания российских миротворцев в Карабахе на срок больше, чем 1 января 2024 года, когда окончательно Карабах становится территории Азербайджана и, согласно, так сказать, утверждениям азербайджанского руководства, на территории своего государства иностранных военных быть не должно. То есть российские миротворцы должны быть выведены. Что в этой ситуации делает Россия? Она находит аргумент, согласно которому российские миротворцы могут гарантировать безопасность армян Карабаха, если они там остаются на какое-то время, либо хотят даже вернуться из Армении, куда они спешно вынуждены были бежать. То есть на самом деле мы наблюдаем особенность политики России, состоящей в том, что реальных предложений, которые готовы были бы, так сказать, быть компромиссом между Арменией и Азербайджаном в решении конфликта, у Москвы, к сожалению, нет. У нее есть тактические попытки просто сохранить свое военное присутствие в регионе. В доказательство того, что я вот так вижу эту ситуацию, говорит последнее интервью заместителя министра иностранных дел Галузина и для выступления самого Лаврова, которые, в общем, продолжали утверждать, что решение возможно только в рамках трехсторонних соглашений, подписанных сразу в ноябре 2020 года. И что проблема в том, что мешает, что Запад, перехватывает наработки, достигнутые в этом соглашении, используют эти наработки как свои и помешают договоренностям так сказать, между, между Азербайджаном и Арменией. То есть конструктива вот в этих заявлениях не видно. Есть только одна устойчивая, так сказать, устойчивый тренд на противостояние с Западом в проблеме решения Карабахского конфликта, вообще армяно-азербайджанского конфликта. И я полагаю, что это будет продолжаться долго до тех пор, пока основным контрапунктом сегодняшней геополитики является противостояние между Россией и как бы, коллективным Западом. 
а, а сами конфликты такого рода региональные являются, к сожалению, лишь такой разменной монетой в отношениях между Россией и Западом. В этой ситуации а, я настроен очень пессимистично. Если только сами азербайджанцы и армяне не смогут э, найти некий модус вивенди между, в отношениях между собой и достигнуть уровня э, достаточного доверия, чтобы начинать э, решать те проблемы, которые их сегодня э, разделяют. В первую очередь это проблемы обеспечения безопасности армянского населения в, в Карабахе, если она там останется, и этого пресловутого Зангизурского коридора. Выступление, выступление вот сейчас уже моих коллег, я вижу, я вижу некие ожидания того, что эта проблема согласия Армении на, на, на юридический контроль Азербайджана над этим коридором достигнуто быть в ближайшее время не может. Поэтому оптимально, как свидетельствует позиция иранского коллеги, провести эту коммуникацию через Иран. То есть а на дальнейшее это отложить на потом. Да, и это включить как пункт рамочного договора. Я думаю, что это может быть вариантом, но это не увеличит как бы, уровень доверия. Да? между сторонами. И в этой, в, этой, в этой связи я сделаю последнее замечание, которое, мне кажется, увеличило бы уровень доверия, либо не позволило ему упасть. Я говорю о том, явно, так сказать, по процессе подготовки каких-то показательных судебных процессов в Азербайджане над бывшими лидерами Нагорного Карабаха, над армянскими лидерами Нагорного Карабаха. Я понимаю стремление Азербайджана осудить их как главных, так сказать, в глазах Азербайджана виновников, но это не может быть публично достаточно хорошей базой для, так сказать, для укрепления доверия между армянами и азербайджанцами. Я думаю, что сегодня ситуация, я бы сказал, великодушие, так сказать, Баку по отношению к тем, кто потерпел поражение на фронтах Карабаха, должно быть самым высоким, так сказать, факт, элементом как бы, доверия, растущего доверия между армянами и азербайджанцами. Нельзя сегодня устраивать публичную международную как бы, порку с побежденных, так сказать, врагов. Это мое личное мнение, но мне кажется, что сегодня уровень ненависти в мире настолько высок, что, во всяком случае, на этом небольшом, так сказать, куске территории мира, хотя бы усилиями его главных участников, надо было бы стремиться уменьшить, уменьшить вот этот уровень взаимной ненависти. Вот все, что я хотел сказать сейчас. Uh, our colleagues uh, from Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia have uh, taken your uh, messages uh, in, uh, seriously. And uh, I will switch directly now to our Turkish colleague, uh, to Ms. Ine Ozgar uh, She will give us the Turkish uh, view of the developments in uh, the latest developments in South Caucasus and how is it viewed Uh, from Istanbul, from Turkey, uh, Turkey, and uh, what are the perspectives? Uh, is uh, is the chapter closed and the new chapter uh, of the cooperation uh, is foreseeable in, in the nearest future? Thanks so much for the invitation, uh, and I would definitely agree with uh, your your last remark. Uh, Turkey definitely sees this new period new post-conflict period as a moment of opportunity, both for itself, but also for the regional countries themselves. So uh, I'm not going to get into much detail about the turkish azerbaijani relations. I mean, yes, everyone knows that like they're in great strategic depth, that they are in fact a military alliance based on Akasus Foderis. 
so I think we're pretty much on the same page with that. Uh, but how Turkey sees the current um, situation and the future prospects in the region is, like I've mentioned, very productive and very hopeful. So um, in this regard, the uh, prerequisite of stability comes forth because like for Ankara and also um, I've seen this echoed quite a few times by my colleagues in this webinar is that without stability, without dialogue, um, we're basically stuck in the same place. And uh, like my colleagues also mentioned, there are still areas uh, where we need extensive dialogue and where we need extensive diplomacy. So moving forward, this will be crucial. Um, and yes, Turkey has a very uh, strategic role in the region, uh, both for historic reasons, but also for strategic reasons. Um, it has a role in multiple joint projects, such as the um, Zengizer Corridor, although it is still a work in progress, uh, the Trans-Caspian Energy Pipeline, the Kars Baku Tbilisi Railway, uh, the Middle Corridor Project, and what's important here is that these aren't only uh, Turkish turban projects. They're projects of common interests and they encourage regional ownership. So I'd really like to uh, emphasize the fact the, that these projects um, come forth with a huge potential for cooperation, which will be conducive um, to sustainable peace. Um, in this regard, Turkey is uh, ready to work with the collaborating partners. We've seen this uh, echoed quite a few times in um, Aliyev's statements and Erdogan's statements. Um, so, for example, regarding the Zengizer Corridor, um, Turkey and Azerbaijan, I mean, ideally would want to do it with Armenia. But we've also seen Erdogan um, opening the door to Iran in case um, Tehran would be interested. So uh, what this means is that these projects will go forth, but whether they will go forth with Armenia or not uh, is up to everyone. So I think this is an uh, important point to emphasize. Um, and I am a uh, sustainable development uh, expert by training, uh, educated in a uh, leading French institute. So I'd like to say a few words about um, like Armenia's future path uh, in terms of sustainable development and how the recent um, French card plays into that. Um, so I would say the Armenian diaspora has been, uh, Armenia is in fact the worst enemy when it comes to sustainable development. Why am I saying this? Uh, because it has been years long of uh, advocacy that led to isolation of Armenia in a region with great potential and great cooperation potential. Uh, it led to being excluded from uh, multiple important projects. And I'm scared that this might be the case uh, moving forward. So now we really have the chance to uh, turn things around and really uh, ensure that Armenia becomes a part of all these uh, projects. Um, so yes, I would agree that uh, one of my colleagues mentioned uh, that diversification in terms of uh, military um, defense imports um, is a good thing. It is surely a good thing, but we should also make sure that um, diversification does not equal to dependencies. So uh, when we're trying to break free from Russia, uh, we should ensure, I mean, there has to be vigilance in uh, making sure that Yerevan is not creating new dependencies with France. Uh, which I would say is quite uh, power hungry, um, especially after its uh, exodus from uh, Africa. So Armenia should really play its cards well and uh, make sure it's, um, uh, it chooses wisely um, because this uh, dependency issue has been a real obstacle in the country's sustainable development, as well as its inclusion um, in joint projects. So this is something I'd like to emphasize as a concluding point. 
thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oskarasin. Uh, Oskarasahin. I'm sorry for pronouncing uh, incorrectly okay. your last name. Uh, so, uh, uh, the Ar Armenian and our Azeri colleagues have said, uh, talked about the uh, uh, normalization of the relationship uh, between uh, Turkey and uh, Armenia. Uh, mm -hmm. So, should we wait uh, until the uh, peace treaty is signed? Uh, I remember uh, the Turkish side, President Erdogan, uh, was always underlining that we are not against, we are in favor of uh, normalizing relationship with Armenia, but first it should be uh, the, the Azerbaijan and Armenia who uh, have to normalize their relationship. So. Uh, is this uh, the, the peace treaty uh, now the uh, mandatory for normalization or the process will start uh, immediately in upcoming weeks or months? Um, I would definitely say that the uh, prerequisite of the peace treaty is a, uh, is a fair call. I mean, it's a fair request. Because, um, like we said, uh, without the peace treaty on the table, we can't move forward. Uh, we don't have the clear uh, guidelines, the clear framework to move forward. And it's, it will also be a sign of goodwill um, from Armenia's side, uh, which Turkey is really expecting to see. And I think it will definitely be a uh, boost for the Turkish-Armenian uh, normalization process indeed. And also, again, uh, Yerevan also needs to comply. I mean, not just that it should, but it also must comply, given the uh, Article, 5, uh, Article 9 of the peace treaty, saying that Armenia should cooperate in unblocking all economic and transport links in the region. So, um, like, showing goodwill in uh, these kind of uh, areas will definitely be conducive to Ankara Yerevan normalization, yes. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, uh, let me clarify, uh, just uh, the uh, Zeri colleague has mentioned, and also in uh, visiting Nakhchevan, uh, President Erdogan also underlined that if there is no will from Armenia uh, to agree on the um, uh, transpassing, the transiting, the, the, the Zangezur uh, corridor, there could be the agreement alternative route uh, through uh, Iran territory. So should we consider this as the obstacle uh, for the normalization of Armenia-Turkish uh, relationship or it could be uh, removed from the, uh, from the agenda? I think it's definitely an important point um, in the agenda. Uh, on Ankara's side. And it will be up to Yerevan to uh, change that narrative, um, to really turn things around and say, yes, we are committed to uh, doing this with you guys. And uh, here are our demands. Uh, we're open to uh, listening your demands, simply uh, working together and talking. Um, so yes, if uh, Iran takes uh, Armenia's place uh, in a joint project, in a trilateral project, uh, yes, that would definitely reflect on the normalization process as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your very uh, food-provoking, thought-provoking. Uh, you, always. Uh, understand the recommendations from for the Armenian colleagues with regard to the diversification humbly, and humbly. dependencies. Uh, <laughs> I think... Uh, I think our Armenian colleague may, may, may reflect on this. Uh, I don't want to uh, absorb the time uh, and my position, and I open here the floor for the, uh, uh, for the questions. Please, uh, here is the Q&A uh, and the, the, the option, uh, and as well as the raise, to raise the hand, and you can put the question. Uh, I still have the questions, but I give the floor uh, to the auditorium uh, who is uh, ready to put the questions. I'll be waiting for you uh, or I will continue with my own questions further. Oh.
Okay. Uh, so far, uh, 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 we don't have uh, the questions uh, uh, from uh, the uh, audience. So uh, I will ask about the uh, three plus three uh, platform. Uh, so, uh, so Dr. Shafiev has uh, uh, focused on the three plus three as one of the alternatives. Uh, I am neither reflecting the uh, the position of Georgian government, definitely, but uh, uh, most probably uh, my colleagues in my foundation fully agree with me that the uh, 3 plus 3 platform is totally unacceptable for Georgia uh, because of the uh, Russia's occupation of Georgian territories and Russia's presence there. So, uh, uh, let, let me ask you first, uh, our uh, Iranian colleague, uh, Dr. Barzagar, uh, Mr. Barzagar, how you see the, the perspective of the uh, 3 plus 3 platform, having in mind that what I have just said in uh, relationship between Georgia and the Russian Federation. Could you proceed further without Georgia or... Uh, is it necessary to have three plus three instead of three plus two? And what is the perspective? What are the uh, prospects for Iran to be part of this platform? Well, actually, Iran has said that it will support three plus three platform because uh, Iran sees the situation in a broader strategic matter. Uh, rather than seeing the issue as a kind of, uh, you know, Azari, Turkey, uh, you know, uh, matter. I think at the same time, this is the position Iran has taken. Uh, of course, it depends how the geopolitical developments go ahead and what, what would be the process of the changing geopolitical situation. But at the same time, we should understand that Iran support any kind of regional economic cooperation because it believes that this will add to the stability of the region and uh, will bring prosperity for, for the region. Therefore, uh, uh, this would also add to an increase or enhance Iran's current neighborhood policy because at the end of the day, uh, what, it, what is the concerns of Iran is not uh, taking the U.S. or, or you know, adversary forces coming to the region. Therefore, if there is a kind of relief for Iran that the situation wouldn't go in that, in that regard, then Iran is uh, absolutely cooperative in, in, this, in this context. I would say that what it's, Iran is trying to say is expansion of diplomacy, because sometimes expansion of diplomacy can fulfill and feel the concerns of all parties involved in the region. And this is the natural thing that Iran is saying. There are three big uh, 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 regional power who are, who are historically and geographically attached with the region and at the same time, culturally and you know, historically uh, have been attached to the region. Uh, every of these uh, you know, involved actors have, have some reasons to be involved in the region. Therefore, uh, I think that expansion of diplomacy might be good, irrespective of the fact that Georgia has some problem with Russia. Uh, still, I think Iran will, uh, will, uh, will support this kind of platform, three plus three because expansion of diplomacy could bring stability because that relieve, you know, security concerns of all parties. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Mr. Dubnov, would you also like to make a comment regarding the 3 plus 3 platform? Um, Hello. No, I, I think uh, 
Mr. Dubnow cannot hear my question for the moment, but uh, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. please, sir. Uh, я полагаю, что это было бы неплохой реальной возможностью все-таки консолидировать решение конфликта внутри этого большого пространства. Я согласен здесь с коллегой из Ирана. Пространство, в котором исторически тяготеют, кроме трех стран непосредственно Южного Кавказа, три, в общем, большие, в разной степени региональные державы. Я прекрасно понимаю озабоченность Грузии по этому поводу. Да, конечно. С одной стороны, отношения Грузии с Москвой обременены оккупацией части грузинской территории России после войны восьмого года. Но с другой стороны, в общем, в России считают, что нынешнее правительство Грузии весьма лояльно по отношению к Москве, даже более чем лояльно. Поэтому э, здесь, здесь, я думаю, э, не очень, так сказать, я бы сказал, фундаментально слышится вот эта причина э, неготовности Двилиси к такого рода формату. Да? Э, но я повторяю, что еще раз о своей мысли, что э, решение всех этих э, конфликтов сегодня находится, я бы сказал, в рамках, в парадигме вообще противостояния России и Запада, которое, которое обременено, так сказать, которое связано с войной в Украине. Да? Пока война в Украине так или иначе не определит будущее, вообще говоря, мирового порядка, я не думаю, что можно будет решать серьезные или, так сказать, на долгое время региональные конфликты. Но повторю свою мысль. Окно возможностей именно сегодня, когда внимание мира отвлечено на, на войну на Ближнем Востоке, окно возможностей для решения между двумя странами региона, между непосредственно Азербайджаном и Арменией этих проблем, могло бы стать, так сказать, палочкой-выручалочкой, выходом. Да? Вот я так бы ответил. Um, thank you, Mr. Dubnov. Uh, let me get back to our uh, South Caucasian colleagues. Uh, uh, first, uh, Dr. Shafiev. Um, uh, thank you very much. What is your, what is yeah. your, what is your view regarding the uh, three plus three uh, platforms perspective? Maybe, uh, uh, maybe there is more uh, news. Uh, uh, in Baku about Georgia's uh, government, Georgia's government's position regarding 3 plus 3. We haven't heard, heard a lot uh, from, uh, from them uh, regarding that in the yeah. recent times. Okay. Um, and also, if you allow me, besides the questioning, uh, answering the question about 3 plus 3, I would like to address two more issues very briefly. So let's start with 3 please, plus 3. Please. Um, uh, yes, the we perfectly know the concern of Georgia. I think for this reason, after this free plus free initiative, which was voiced uh, immediately after the war 2020, uh, lately President Ali speaking more about as a nucleus to, of any cooperation platform about free countries, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia. Upon that, you can build some other uh, platforms and where probably we cannot have in the near future three plus three, but what we can have, we can have different variations of, uh, let's say, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, already we have that platform. Uh, there is discussion now, Iran, Turkey, Azerbaijan, there is discussion about Russia, Azerbaijan, Iran, in terms of the transportation links. So um, that's probably the way how we should proceed. Again, um, mm -hmm. the idea of uh, Azerbaijan's approach that the 
countries of the region, three countries, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, should decide their fate and fate the, the, the whole region, not the outside actors. That's the, the main idea upon which you can build our uh, regional uh, cooperative platforms. And let's not forget the, uh, the, our European colleagues um, and uh, the United States has also interest in the region. Not, of course, they're now distracted by many other things, but still, uh, we can think about some other ideas about uh, these kind of three plus one and three plus two platforms. Uh, I just would like to make two more comments, um, short comments. One about, again, coming back to Zengizur. Iran, uh, our colleague, uh, you know, speaking, I mean, Iran, many colleagues from Iran and the government speaking that the Zengizur will cut off uh, Iran from Armenia. So that's the main concern and we are objecting to that. But in the meantime, <laughs> Iran is welcoming this kind of uh, route through Iranian territory. And uh, I think this is something not sincere. Uh, it's more about to keep control of the routes through Iranian territory. But again, Armenia, I see we have this kind of mindset. So no, no, nothing will do, uh, nothing comes good from Azerbaijan. We won't do Zangezur. And this is very hard to overcome my understanding in, in Armenian uh, psych, in, in uh, thinking, in mentality. And um, я хотел бы также э, отреагировать на выступление, на комментарии нашего, кол нашего коллеги Аркадия Дубнова по поводу амнистии. Э, вы знаете, это очень сложный вопрос. Э, здесь надо брать несколько факторов. Первая травма, нанесенная за годы оккупации и военные преступления, э, в азербайджанском обществе все еще живы. Более того, вот э, в 20 году э, Арай Карутинян, он на видео сам хвастался в интернете, что он отдал приказ э, стрелять по Гянджи. Э, вот как раз э, прошло три года, ровно три года, жилой квартал был э, разбомблен ракетой. Э, поэтому просто так взять, простить, я думаю, что не то, что правительство, э, азербайджанское общество к этому не готово. Э, Вторая проблема, вот мы слышим, что... Э, особенно от европейских политиков и так далее, что вот 1915 год – это серьезная травма для армян, и вот надо понимать их ситуацию. Но почему-то 15 год, да, а вот 90-е годы мы как-то должны забыть. Это не совсем непонятный подход. То есть или мы забываем, не то что забываем, или мы прощаем историю, оставляем историю историкам, или же все же тогда 90-е годы – это гораздо свежая рана. Uh, есть еще один момент, uh, то, что ни один из тех, кто арестован, из лидеров, карабахских лидеров, он не высказал ни сожаления, ни извинения по поводу своих действий, uh, по поводу военных преступлений. Поэтому можно амнистировать людей, которые действительно раскаиваются и сожалеют. И есть еще четвертая проблема. Армения, в принципе, правительство Армении, оно готовится uh, в полномасштабный юридической войне с Азербайджаном. В принципе, Армения ратифицировала статут Международного уголовного суда и, в принципе, открыто говорит, что мы это сделали не, не из-за России, а сделали против Азербайджана. В этих условиях о какой амнистии можно говорить, когда идет, будет идти юридическая война между Арменией и Азербайджаном, скорее всего, надо было бы решить этот вопрос. Может быть, после мирного договора договориться, что а, обнуляются взаимные претензии. Но пока от Армении этого мы не слышим, поэтому и вряд ли какая-либо будет амнистия. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Shafiev. Um, I think I should give the floor uh, to Dr. Benjamin Pogosian. Uh, my question is, uh, you could comment definitely on what has been said, and of course, regarding the platform of 3 plus 3. And uh, my very last question is about the internal uh, situation, political situation in, uh, in Armenia. Uh, how is it considered in Armenia, the signing of the peace treaty? Uh, would it trigger further uh, destabilization in Armenia, or uh, it is all uh, clear now that uh, Pashinyan 
will retain its power and uh, will continue ruling Armenia and continue uh, to open the uh, uh, perspectives of relationship of the regional uh, uh, states. Thank you. Well, I will start from the last question. My understanding is that at least as of now, there are no real threats to a Pashinyan's rule. Uh, so let's not forget that parliamentary elections took place in June 2021. And the next parliamentary elections should take place only in June 2026. Mm -hmm. And again, as of now, I don't see how or why we should have seen a parliamentary elections, like resignation of prime minister, etc. So most probably, if no additional force majors, which no one can exclude or no one can anticipate, probably Pashinyan at least will be prime minister of Armenia until 2026. What will happen then? It's uh, too challenging to anticipate or assess. Regarding free plus free, my understanding is that this platform will continue to work without Georgia. I don't believe that, especially given this uh, next year parliamentary elections in Georgia, current Georgian government will say, okay, I'm ready to take part in this uh, free plus free sitting next to Russia. So my understanding is that at least until October 2024 Georgian elections, Georgia will not take part. Officially, this platform will be called free plus free. De facto, it will be free plus two. And I don't exclude that the meeting may take place even by the end of 2023 or early 2024. I mean, second meeting. As I mentioned, the first meeting took place in December 2021 in Moscow. And also today, Prime Minister Pashinyan stated that Armenia is ready to take part in the future meetings of this free plus free, de facto free plus two uh, format. And uh, also the last comment regarding this November 10 trilateral statement, I believe our Turkish colleague stated that uh, there is Article 9 in the November 10, 2020 trilateral statement in which uh, there is a mentioning about restoration of communications, including access uh, via Armenia from Azerbaijan to Nakhijevan. But uh, I think we have to accept that after what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2023 September, when there is no Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, there are no Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, at least the event of September 2023 is simply uh, make this uh, November 10, 2020 trilateral statement avoid. So my perception is it very difficult to say that this statement is still uh, functioning. And to tell that, okay, according to the Article 9, something should be done. Because again, after September 2023, in any case, the main point of this trilateral statement was about Nagorno-Karabakh. So now there is no Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. There are no Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, which means that this entire statement or the context under which the statement was signed, and now we live in a completely different uh, situation. So like to make a reference to this statement and say that Armenia is a black to do something because he signed trilateral statement. But if you look into the trilateral statement, at least the events which took place from December 2022 until September 2023 should not take place. So also I would like to emphasize it that uh, from any point of view, starting from legal and from practical, we may say that currently November 10, 2020 trilateral statement is not working. And that is why also my Azerbaijani colleague said that it's up to Azerbaijan and Russia to discuss what will happen with uh, Russian peacekeepers, which means that even on the deployment of Russian peacekeepers in Nagorno-Karabakh or in Azerbaijan, now Azerbaijan and Russia should come to some new bilateral agreement because again, this uh, trilateral statement is not functioning, it is void, at least uh, starting October 1st, 2023. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, thank you. I want to thank all of the panelists. Uh, um, unfortunately, <laughs> we have run out of the time. Uh, I had uh, some more questions. I wanted to discuss the Middle East uh, crisis, but uh, we are running out, uh, out of time. And uh, thank you very much. A lot has been said, uh, but uh, there is the chance, there is the window of opportunity as uh, Mr. Dubnov has uh, underlined, as well as our colleagues uh, from Azerbaijan and Armenia, that peace treaty could be signed. And we very much welcome uh, 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 further involvement of Georgia uh, as the mediator or providing the platform uh, 
to Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia for direct talks, uh, but I'm sure that uh, uh, the efforts of European Union and the United States will further be uh, 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 used as the opportunity for, uh, for the cooperation and improvements in the relationship. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I wish you peace. Uh, in your countries, in our region, and hopefully our next conversation will have uh, uh, better security uh, conditions and uh, the regional situation. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your participation, your time, and your thoughts expressed at our uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.